Okay, so I now find myself in, in the way of your getting that last coffee break before and some free time before dinner. Uh, and I'm talking about a subject that I have, we have talked about quite a few times in the past, but I think there are quite a few people who still haven't really uh, seen what we're doing with futures and isolates. I apologize. Those of you who were in my workshop yesterday, uh, if you wander off, that's quite okay. There won't be anything in this talk that, that wasn't covered in the workshop. But I think this is actually one of the most important features of version 14, even though it's, it's still labeled as experimental. It's something that is going to change the way people uh, use Dialog APL in the future. Because although, although Kimo said, well, you know, the computers are getting so much faster, for him, he feels you know things are generally fast enough. It isn't actually true that the chips are getting it that much faster anymore. They tapered off about five years ago, and what's happening now is people are putting parallel, several chips, several cores into your computers, rather than the individual cores getting faster. So, as a as a language vendor, I think it's absolutely critical for us to have a good story in terms of making it easy for all of you to tap into all the cores that are available for you. And as I mentioned in, in the keynote this morning, we're pursuing parallel paths to giving you parallel performance. Uh, there's Aaron's work, which, is, um, which he's going to be talking about tomorrow. There's the new parser, which aims to remove sort of a lot of the the overhead in the interpreter itself, but also has the potential to do optimizations, some of which may well be parallel. Nick's going to talk about that uh, tomorrow. And then there's what I'm going to show you now, which is a feature of version 14 called Futures and Isolates, which is something that gives you something you can use immediately to go parallel in version 14.0. And there's a word here, coarse-grained parallelism, um, the goal is to allow APL users to explicitly express parallelism, so that easily identify pieces of your code that could run asynchronously. And we say in the interpreter, the goal of the current technology is that if you have units that could run in parallel that will consume a tenth of a second, then this should be an effective mechanism. So if you have little bits of asynchronous code, loops that you go around in that are consuming a tenth of a second, this will work. Possibly also with smaller units, but certainly that's a target we've set ourselves. Once you get into the compilers, they're going to be able to parallelize much smaller uh, units of work, and that's what Aaron in particular is trying to do. So here's a picture. You've probably all, or many of you, have seen this by now. This is an APL workspace. And what we provide in version 14 is a function called isolate.new, which is in a workspace called isolate. And this expression here, isolate new each, three empty arrays, asks the interpreter to create three isolates, which you can think of as extensions to your workspace. So your workspace just grew some little buds. Uh, and isolates work uh, pretty much exactly the same way that namespaces do. So this is an expression. If these had been three namespaces in any version of Dialog APLs for the last 15 years at least, we would then have drawn these not as extensions to the workspace, but as little circles inside the workspace. But you would have been able to write an expression like this. I've got a three-element vector of spaces on the left and dot, the variable x, and then a three element array on the right, that does a distributed assignment of those three array elements into the spaces. And then you can write an expression like this to compute the average or the mean. You've been able to do that also for 15 years. The difference now is that when you hit enter, those three things happen in parallel in separate processes, three processes that are separate from your current interpreter. So if you have three cores available, they will actually be used by the operating system to, to execute that. So the two pieces, we've seen a picture of an isolate. An isolate looks very much like a namespace. There are few experiments you can perform on an isolate to prove that it's not a namespace. You would have to do timing-related stuff and then look around uh, at your environment 
uh, look sort of out of, up the, the namespace stack to, to determine it. As long as you stay inside a namespace, you can't really tell. And the key difference, as I said, is that any expression, any dot followed by either a name or a parenthesized expression runs in a separate process. And the other piece of the technology that makes this really interesting is that whenever you execute an expression inside one of these isolates, no matter how long that expression takes to run, you immediately get an array item back, which is a new data type called a future. So in that uh, expression we did, we looked at before here, when we executed this, APL actually immediately got a three array element back. It then had to wait uh, for the results to come back because we decided to display them. Um, but if we hadn't displayed them in the session, if we just assigned that to a variable and then called another function or reshaped them um, and just sat on them for waiting for better times, they wouldn't have blocked our function. We could have continued to do some other processing. Structural functions, reshape, partition, enclose, etc., things that are just working on the shape of an array containing futures don't block. It's only when you get to a primitive function, one of the mathematical functions or something that actually needs the data, that APL just automatically blocks at that point and waits for the result of the asynchronous expression to, to complete. And for those of you who can't think about this now without knowing a little bit more about how it's actually implemented, there's a slide. Um, so here's your two core computer. We imagine you've got a dialog APL application running. You execute an expression like this, make me four isolates. The first time you use an isolate, the system creates separate processes to host them. By default, it looks and sees, well, I have two cores. I'm going to create uh, two isolate processes. And then it creates TCP socket connections to them using Conga. And then it starts creating the isolates. And it uses a very simple, at the moment, load balancing. It simply looks to see where which isolate process has the smallest number of isolates already. So the second one goes here, the third one goes there, and the fourth one goes there. And if you then were to execute ex expressions simultaneously in all of these isolates, then regular APL ampersand-based multithreading is used inside this process. So they're then competing for time inside the isolate process. But there's nothing to limit you from only creating two. You might have a two-core computer and create 10 of them if you have an application where you think that's going to give you good performance. One of the things that also works in this first version is that if you have a friend who has another computer or you have compute servers in your machine room, you can run a function called start server. At the moment, there's a very simple filtering mechanism where you declare which machines you want to grant access to use your server. So this would say, well, any machine in this subnet could use it. And that then starts two isolate processes which just sit there waiting for something to happen. And if we had executed this expression uh, for, to, use a, sorry, to use one of these servers, you have to run a function called add server where you give the IP address and you give some port numbers. And then if we had created the isolates in having done that, then those two isolates would have ended up on the other servers. Um, they, did, they can't actually migrate, as this slide suggests, but you would then have ended up with one, one on each. Right, so in Dialog version 14, the futures, the ability of the interpreter to block when it needs one of these results is actually a core language feature. And I think it's mostly John and John Daintree and Jay Fode who did the implementation of that. Whereas the isolates and the operators like uh, I, uh, the functions like isolate.new and the operators the parallel each and so on that we'll see demonstrated in a moment, those are actually implemented in APL. Most of the work was done by Phil Last and then towards the end of the project, I've also participated in that myself. 
So we are still labeling these as experimental, which means that at least some of the details of how you specify how to start them, the filtering of who can use servers, uh, security features, and so on might change. But the fundamental nature of futures and isolates is unlikely to change. So if you use them in your applications now experimentally, you're not likely to have to make much in the way of changes uh, in the future. It's really important that we do have people use them and help us turn them into industrial strength <coughs> tools because there's, own, there's a limit to how much testing we can do uh, ourselves. So, enough slides. Okay, so here is a version 14 session. And I'm going to load the isolate workspace. So the, to use these, you have to create four isolates. Bigger font. I wish I had the... Uh, I actually have a touch screen, so I could have done that, that cute stuff, except I don't have... Uh, is that big enough? Yeah. yeah. Okay, and then I could say, make me some data. Notice I'm using, uh, I'm using one of them newfangled trains here. This is in a top. And I suggest that you start using this. If you need to generate lots of random numbers like this, it, this isn't currently optimized. But I'll bet that Roger has in his plan somewhere to take advantage of the fact that if you do deal a top reshape, the APL interpreter doesn't need to create a four million element array of sixes before it then goes back and generates lots of random numbers. So that should run at least twice as fast in some, uh, or maybe not twice as fast, but significantly faster in a future version of, of APL. So I have rolled four million dice and by doing a split on that array and assigning that, so I get a four element vector, I can assign a million of these into each isolate. And you see, you, that didn't take noticeable time at all. TCP IP requests inside the same computer are very, very fast. I don't think they touch the, the network cards. And then I can compute the mean of each one of those four million element vectors. And as you can see, this is working just the same as if they were in namespaces. There's no, no visible difference, and really no, not even when it comes to performance. But here's the party trick that shows why these are so useful. So now in each one of the four isolates, I'm executing a delay for six seconds, which means I just did a 24-second delay in a mere six seconds. <laughs> <laughs> because they ran in parallel. So we're already closer to, to coffee. Um, now, if I have a nice uh, self-contained function like the Queen's function from uh, the Defense workspace, Queen's 8, we have to ask for the shape, the tally of that, tells us how many different ways you can put, arrange Queen's on an 8 by 8 chessboard. I don't have to create isolates first. In the first example, I created explicitly four isolates, but I can also just say queens, parallel each. Well, the proposal for the language feature when this is no longer a model is that we'll have a new operator called parallel with two vertical bars. And you would write this as parallel each. But in the model, um, it turns out you can use this I with diaresis as a character as a name in Dialog APL, so this looks very much to me like a parallel each, and that's the name of the model. Uh, you could also write isolate.ll each, I think that would be the same thing if you don't have that character. So I do that in parallel, and now I can ask, there are a bunch of status functions, I'll do them fairly quickly because this is timing dependent, so it was still running while I did this. The last one takes a few seconds to work, uh, but I'll now refer to the whole thing, and you see now it hangs. It, it hung very briefly. So what happened there was I launched this. The first 12 actually execute in a very, very short amount of time. Uh, you see the, th the 13th one really gets very much larger. So the first 12 executed in almost no time. So when I asked here which ones, which of the futures in this array, because when I executed this, I immediately got 13 futures back, which of them are still running? There was only the last one running. I then counted the uh, number of items in the result of isolate.values, 
and values is a function which is perfectly safe to call. It will never block for anything that isn't yet available. It returns either null or any value that you ask to have instead. So you can say I'd like zeros and you would have got zeros by default you get a null. And then when I asked the system to count each one of them, it then got into a situation where it had to have the results and it just hung until the last one had been computed. Uh, okay, open task manager. Not much going on. Ah. So here's the other party trick. I define a function called loop, very useful function. Do, does some hard work, you can see. It generates permutations and then it, it gets the distinct values and it just goes around in a loop. So if I call it with a number like 1000, it loops for a bit and tells me that took 798 milliseconds to do. And if I do a loop with the regular each, so this is not the parallel each, it's the normal each, I have a quad core computer and it's running now, it's consuming about 25% of the machine. And that should take about 16 seconds, 17. There isn't time to tell a joke, unfortunately. <laughs> it's taking longer than it's supposed to. It took 28 seconds. Yeah, I wonder what's going on here. This usually runs significantly faster. Ah. <laughs> Back to the beginning. Okay, let's see if this takes. We need a n now we need another joke, but hopefully a shorter one. <laughs> there, it's done. Come on, snap out of it. That is really weird. Suppose it's rule number one of presentations. It took exactly the same amount of time. Okay, well, let's see how we do with the parallel each then. Ah, yeah, so this is the goal, in fact, of the whole exercise is to fill the fish tank. It doesn't look like a fish tank anymore in Windows 8, but... Uh, so I see it ran in roughly the half the time, which was what I was trying to achieve anyway. Uh, it's not really a four-core computer. It's a two-core computer doing hyper-threading. And when you really put your foot to the metal, it's actually, you discover that it is actually only two. So yeah, I don't think I need that. No. Okay, so I can also, I can derive a function with the parallel operator. So Queen's async is now a function which is going to be parallel if I invoke it. And I can say, okay, start computing queens 13. Now create me a little GUI in the meantime. My application continues to do some stuff. And then it enqueues on the result. And you'll see up here it says, ah, you can't quite reach that, but for a while it said the number of solutions to queens 13 is dot, dot, dot. And then just before I moved the laser pointer up there, it filled it in with, with the number. What was happening there was I launched a little defun in a separate APL thread with ampersand, which referenced the result of that asynchronous function call. So th there was a little thread just waiting for this to materialize, and as soon as it did, it populated the form with the result. So that illustrates how you can very easily, if you have a bit of your application that could run in parallel, so something that goes off to, to load data from a database or something like that, you can very, very easily launch it and have it run in parallel with this technology. So now let's do something cute. Um, Fiona mentioned the blog, and recent, one of the recent blog entries before the conference was that Brian posted about some work that he's done I think originally he wrote this application just to learn how to use the dialog GUI about 10 or 15 years ago. Yeah. And uh, then when isolates came along, he thought, okay, let's see if we can parallelize this. And what it 
does is it essentially breaks the picture up according to how many processes you have available and has an isolate compute each one of those. So you can read all about it. The code's all published there. Ah, remember to start a local server. Uh, let's see, here we go. Open a new window. Load isolate. Isolate. Start server. Quote, quote. If you start it with... Ah, that's what the reset was for. Okay. If you start it with no filter as an argument, it will only allow access from the local machine when you start one of these server processes. The reason I started a server process is I'm going to use servers on this machine and some other machines. Um, I'm going to use 12 cores to render the Mandelbrot set. So here's, uh, here's Brian's original function. We're low on time, but basically it's, uh, so I won't go into it, but it's doing the Mandelbrot, you know, the complex number multiplication down here. It takes as its argument the real coordinates, which are the horizontal ones, and the imaginary coordinates, which are the, the vertical ones. And then all Brian had to do to start using isolates was that he had to write a little bit of code here which depending on the number of processes did the calculation for the coordinates uh, for the imaginary coordinates so here he's simply dividing up that range into pieces and then there's a global variable which is telling him how many cores are available and either he just calls his original build set core function for the whole thing or he says Read this commented line first. It just says real isolates dot build set core imaginary. So that just distributes that vector of ranges into the isolates and they do the computation. Since we're running on time, I won't run this twice. I'll just immediately explain um, the line that I'm actually using. You'll see there's an unzip here and a zip. And that's because the isolates that I'm using are actually one of them Four of them are in Hong Kong and four of them are in the Netherlands. And the data that's returned by this is actually substantial. So I was losing a lot of time just in the data transmission backwards and forwards. Zip and unzip are very simple cover functions for two I-beams that are in version 14 that allow you to do LZ4 and PK zip uh, compression built into the interpreter. So I'm just using those to... Um, and then he had to initialize the isolates and the important expression here is he made a set of new isolates as many as he had processors and copying in his build set core function and the zip function because the zip function is also needed on the server side to get this to work. So with a bit of luck, so this is connecting to my the server Ah, it's using the wrong port numbers. Okay, well, it'll give up in a bit. Now it's connecting to the server in Hong Kong and the one in Holland. So we didn't get four cores on my laptop. We only got the ones that were in Hong Kong and, and Holland. And I'll do a recalculation here. And that took four seconds. If I tell the system I don't want to use any of the external processes and I briefly now toggle between high resolution back to low resolution and then to high resolution again, we'll redo the calculation, this time only using uh, one core. And I think that takes twice as long, despite the fact that the isolate servers we were using, oh, much longer. Um, and let's see if I can find the windows. Are they still there? Ah, they've gone off the... Let's do it again, just so we can see the fish tanks fill up. Toggle back. Okay, well, very briefly. <laughs> In Hong Kong and... Click draw, okay, there we go. Anyway, 
So all I had to do on those servers was run this add, add uh, start server function with the IP address of the hotel here, and those servers were then available to me. These two servers were made available to us by a, a global cloud provider who is interested in making some kind of deal with us. Uh, so if you think you have an application where you, you know, the data security issues don't mean that you have to host everything locally, uh, we may be able to put you in touch with somebody who can provide cheap global um, hosting in, I think, both the US, in Europe, and in Asia uh, to run your isolates on. And so just to reiterate, the goal has been to provide deterministic parallelism. Yeah, I didn't really talk about that in the introduction, but the point about that is that if you have some APL code, the idea is that you can just throw in some of these parallel operator things anywhere you like in the code, and it's not going to change the flow of logic in your application because the blocking just happens automatically when a function needs the result. So as long as your functions are not don't have side effects, they are just doing calculations like this Mandelbrot thing, you can safely pepper your application code with parallel eaches without changing the logic, as long as there are no errors and stuff like that. Uh, but if, if the calculations work, then your logic is unchanged. So it, unlike systems that require you to create semaphores and then block on them explicitly, it doesn't require anywhere near as much change to your application. Bang for the buck here and now, for coarse grain parallelism, please use them, and uh, if you know they'll become in really industrial strength in this release cycle. So by 14.1, they'll really be, I hope, tough stuff. Yeah, thank you. Do we have time for questions? Uh, you took your Queen's function and just said you, you uh, gave it the parallel operator? Yeah. How does that safely work? The parallel operator creates an empty isolate and takes the operand function and copies it into it. So the Queen's function found itself alone inside an empty namespace. And since it doesn't require anything other than its arguments and to re return its result, it's, it's fine with that. Obviously, other functions would have a problem. They wouldn't survive. <clears throat> I was thinking, what about uh, write and isolate? Um, I have been very happily using the ride with isolates. It wasn't shown in the demo today, but you can, cre you can initialize your APL sessions in such a way that they connect back to a ride rather than the ride making a connection to them. And if you initialize them in that way, then you can get the isolate sessions to connect back to a ride and make themselves available for debugging. Um, and in, in the future, well, actually already, you can enable an APL session to turn on ride connectivity while it's running. So you could have it run until it hits an error and then connect to the ride. Yeah. Yeah, thank you.